Greetings. I am Tom Earl. I know you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, it means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. My friends, I have a new series for you. This is called the Listening Deeper or the Re-Listen series. You can call it either one. I know I am. Now, you may have heard this intro before. We are using the same intro for this series. So have no fear if you're listening to this again and thinking, oh, I've heard this episode before. Don't worry. Same great intro. Absolutely amazing new podcast. So feel free to hit the skip 30 seconds if you've heard this before. But if this is your first time hearing this, welcome, my friends. What we have, we are presenting to you over these next episodes is really some deeper listenings or some re-listens to some of our most requested, some of our most listened to, some of my favorite episodes that we've done. Now, we have put out over 300 episodes since this has started. That means all the way back to 2016, I've put out one episode a week, every single week without fail since 2016. That means there's a lot of really awesome interviews, solo episodes. There's some really great things in there that you probably haven't heard if you're just joining us or even if you're a longtime listener. So what I want to do is pull together a number of my favorite ones and your favorite ones that you have listened to or that have been listened to before you. And I want you to either hear them fresh for the first time or give them a re-listen yourself. I'm telling you, I have re-listened to each of these and really just thinking about where I was in my life then or the wisdom from then that applies to now, because some of these are going to be from 2016. Some are going to be from last year. Some of them are going to be, you know, weeks before everything that went down in 2020. So I want to share these with you as a gift going into the time vault of our episodes. And really, I invite you to go through these with new ears, with new hearts, because we are new people here in this moment. Now, I invite you to let me know if you listen to it, what year do you think this week's episode was from? And I'd love to hear your thoughts, my friends. I look forward to sharing this, listening deeper as we re-listen series with you. Let us jump into this week's re-listen. Here we go. Greetings. I am Tom Earl. On this week's episode, we talk Facebook ads, leadership, and flourishing with Monica Louie. Check it out. Woo! As you can see, I am not alone. I have an amazing guest. She goes by the name of Monica Louie. What's going on, Monica? Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I appreciate it. We, we've, been, we've had this in the works for a little bit now, and so I'm glad we finally found a date that works and are, are doing it. So thank you. Well, thank you. Let's do it. Do you mind if I introduce you to the good folks out there via reading to them your wonderfully provided bio? <laughs> no problem. Go for it. Monica Louie is a Facebook and Instagram ad strategist who helps ambitious online entrepreneurs increase their impact with high converting ads. You may have heard of her on the Smart Passive Income Podcast, the Boss Mom Podcast, the Art of Online Business Podcast, the Tom Earl, the Celebration Podcast, or her own podcast called Flourish to Seven Figures. Along with her premium agency, Team Flourish, Louie manages ads for six and seven figure online business owners, has managed more than two million in ad spend, and has taught hundreds to successfully run their own ads through her online training program, Flourish with Facebook Ads. Y'all, we have a genuine certified Facebook and Instagram ad genius in the building. Monica, thanks for once again for being here. Let's start with gratitude. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate this opportunity. Yes. So, okay, this is how we always like to start is that the bio is dope, certified. Okay. And there's, there's only so much we can gain from the bio. So we want to know if we were your friend, if we were like hanging out, chilling, what is something that like 
if you really knew me, that you something you could never learn from the bio is is what? Oh, um, well, I mean, everybody who knows me knows that my favorite color is purple. I am pretty obsessed. I mean, I can walk through a store and my husband will keep going and I will be over here because something purple caught my eye. So I had to stop and see what it was. So, I mean, I'm a fan of the color purple. It's been part of my life for my entire life. And, um, yeah, so I, I, (laughs) it doesn't matter what shade I kind of lean toward everything being purple. That's awesome. Purple is my favorite color, purple and black. Very cool. Well, black is my husband's favorite color. Oh, that's what's up. <laughs> my wife's favorite color is blue. So our wedding colors were purple and blue. Oh, pretty. I like it. Very <laughs> nice. So let's let's do a little bit of origin story here. Did you, when you were growing up as a kid, and they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Were you like, well, one day there'll be this thing called Facebook, and then there'll be this thing <laughs> called Facebook ads, and I will be like a genius at it. Is, is, that, is that how it went? That's exactly how it went. I mean, I, my mom said that my first word was Facebook. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, it was meant to be basically. Um, no, actually, I, let's see, when I was growing up, I just, I had this vision for myself that I was going to, you know, grow up, go to college, get a good job, and then, you know, get really good at whatever it was that I was going to do and do that for, you know, 40-ish years and then retire and travel the world and, you know, along the way, grow a family. That was my vision for my life. Um, and no, I, I didn't know anything about Facebook ads. I mean, even, you know, a few years back, um, and I certainly didn't know that that was going to be my path and my passion for helping others build their businesses in this online world. So then how did you get there? What take us like, you know, the Google maps where you drop the person, we see the house, do that with your life. Like, where was it? Sure. Where did it, where did that plan? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that plan broke down somewhere where that yeah. didn't, happen or didn't happen. Go for it. Okay. So I grew up in Salem, Oregon. I'll take you way back. I grew up in Salem, Oregon, um, the capital of the state of Oregon. And then I went to college at the University of Oregon, um, which was really big school. And the first time I experienced diversity, really, I mean, um, getting out of my bubble. And so that really opened my eyes. And then after college, I wanted to be in the big city. And so I moved to Portland. Um, and that's when I started my career as a financial advisor. I studied business administration and I had a degree with a concentration in finance. Um, but somebody told me that if you work with money, you are going to have a lot of money. And so I thought, well, that sounds good to me. That was the goal is really to be financially secure and fulfilled with my career. And so I started off in this, um, in this finance world and ended up, um, working on commission only, which was really hard. And I did that for a a year and a half. Um, but I felt very young. Um, I was 22, you know, just very young and just not, didn't have a lot of self-confidence going out and trying to get clients and, and help them and, you know, be this professional business person. Um, I just felt very green and very, you know, very early on in my career. And so I ended up getting a job at a local community bank. And then from there, I found my corporate job um, in the world of pension administration. So doing um, behind the scenes admin work for 401k plans. And then that's how I started. I was an analyst. um, And then I moved into the role of account manager, where at one point I had well over 100 clients all over the United States. And I was their point of contact to to help them manage their 401k plans. Um, So that's where I became kind of client facing on the phone um, and via email trying to manage and keep all my clients happy. And I had a a good amount of experience doing that. Um, But as I was doing that, then that's when I ended up getting married and my husband and I, you know, started planning our family. And I realized that the demands of this corporate job were not going to be in alignment with me wanting to spend time with my kids as they were little. Um, I always envisioned myself being a career woman, having, you know, having a job and working and growing a family at the same time. That's what I saw my mom do. Um, But then as I started to, you know, plan, we started to plan for our first child, um, we realized 
well, I realized that for the first time I saw my friends starting to leave their careers to stay home with their babies. And that all of a sudden became the path that I wanted to go down at that time for that season of life. So um, my husband and I started to do what we could to put ourselves in a financial position to go from two incomes down to one. Um, We paid off our car, we saved up some money. And um, then I ended up doing part-time at my job for about a year before I ended up leaving, my husband got a promotion. And then um, I, by that time I was pregnant with my daughter. We had just found out that we were pregnant with our second. And we felt like that was a good time for me to leave. And the goal was that I would stay home, you know, become a stay at home mom for while my kids were little. But at the same time, I really wanted to figure out a way that I could make money and build a business from home on my own, but I had no idea what that looked like. And I had no idea anything about Facebook ads at that time. Um, But in that transition, we were trying to be smart with our money. You know, we were very nervous. We felt very vulnerable intentionally going from two incomes down to one. And so we realized that only, gosh, about a month and a half in to me being a full-time stay-at-home mom, that our savings was started to starting to dip. And I was pregnant with our daughter and I just did not want to have to go back to work. I knew that I had that option if I, if I needed it, but I really didn't want to, to, to have to do that. And I also didn't want to create financial strain for my family because I had this desire to spend more time with my kids while they, while they were little. So that's when my husband and I decided to pay off all of our debt as quickly as possible. And so in two years, we paid off $120,000 of debt, all on a single middle-class income. And that led me to my first online business, my blog about our um, our debt-free family is what the name of it was. And just sharing my journey of us getting out of debt. We were paying off debt really quickly. People were asking us how we were doing it. And so then that's when I got the idea to build an online business, helping others realize the possibilities of paying off debt and also helping them with figuring out their plan to do so. So that was my first venture into the online world. Damn. (laughs) <laughs> that's so awesome <laughs> there's like a little similar overlap for me um my i was always trying to get my agency or my business to be the full-time hustle and then once my daughter was born i was like okay i do not want to have to go back to work i want to stay here with her work from home be with her so i i that that extra motivation just does something to you right yeah, absolutely. I just I wanted control over my schedule and I didn't want to have the commute and I didn't want to have the 50 plus hour work weeks and all of that and I just knew there had to be another way and that if I trusted myself I could figure out that way. And so looking back, I'm so glad that I did. There's like a a, a phrase from my my wife's people. It's uh that like your your baby's born with like a pot of gold attached to their their ankle. And that's just what we found that like your kids just bring these blessings to you. It's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely clearly i'm like let's just talk about our kids i'm like now nah, that parent <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty amazing right <laughs> okay so then what but the, your bio isn't about debt right. family.com so I made so a what, pivot. what happened yeah so i was starting to build this blog i was learning about online business i started following people like pat flynn amy porterfield And by following Amy Porterfield, she taught me the wonders of Facebook ads. So she said to build an audience, um, you can use Facebook ads to get your message in front of people for a very low cost. And uh, so she also taught me about the power of webinars. So what I did is I created this webinar, this Jet Freedom Training and I knew it was my my system for helping people create their plan to get out of debt. And I had a very small audience. You know, I had low traffic to my blog. It was just, you know, a baby blog at that point. And I decided that I was going to try this Facebook ad thing. And I talked to my husband. He, you know, he was cool with me investing a little bit of money into my business for Facebook ads, even though I wasn't yet making any money. But I knew that if I followed step by step what Amy said that I could I could figure it out. And so I created my first campaign. This was the fall of 2000 
15. Um, and that worked really well. I was pleasantly surprised at how well that converted. And then I took my learnings from that campaign and a couple months later did my next campaign and dropped my costs even lower, got amazing results. And I was having a good time building, building my audiences and teaching people the power of getting out of debt. So from there, this um, network, my growing network online and the personal finance blogging community um, started to have an interest in Facebook ads. And somebody found out that I had done Facebook ads for myself and got pretty good results. And so my name started to be dropped as somebody who knew something about Facebook ads anytime somebody had a question. And at first I was very resistant to it. I was just like, hey, you know, I, I did this for myself a couple of times. It worked out pretty well. I was pleased, but I can't, you know, say that I'm expert or that I could, you know, know the answer to everything. And so anyway, it ended up leading to somebody reaching out and wanting me to help them create a campaign to promote a blog post and they had a strategy. And so I worked with them. We got pretty good results. And then word continued to spread. Somebody else reached out to work with them. Again, I was very upfront about my limited experience, but we ended up getting amazing results. And then somebody else reached out. We started getting amazing results. And so word just kind of started to spread by the end of 2016 at this point that I was somebody who knew a thing or two about Facebook ads. And at the same time, my husband, oh, my husband and I were kind of changing our financial journey. We were, we were less, we were not paying off the debt as quickly. I mean, I was more focused on growing my business, but I was trying to figure out the best, um, the best path for me. And I really had this love for online business and helping others build their online businesses. So I ended up selling my blog. And when the Facebook ads thing came up, my goal initially was just to help people build their blogs and their businesses, get them off the ground. But when the Facebook ads thing came up and kept coming up and I realized I was having a lot of fun working with a bunch of different people with different strategies and we were having amazing results, that's when I realized, okay, there's something here. So I ended up going full force into becoming first a Facebook ads coach. And then I built my program. Once my coaching schedule got maxed out very quickly, um, I built my program Flourish with Facebook ads to help more people at a lower cost create their campaigns. And then at the same time that I launched that program, that's when people started reaching out for me to run their ads for them. And so that's when I started getting my agency off the ground. So it all moved very quickly, but it's been a lot of fun. We, we got to go back. I've never heard of anybody who was able to sell their blog. You said it was like an afterthought. That's badass. <laughs> It was pretty cool. I mean, it worked out. I don't really have tips for how you can go about doing that. I mean, the 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 stars aligned. So it was somebody in the personal finance community who um, who I, I had worked with with Facebook ads actually, and he kept asking me every time we would meet. You know, if you know anybody who is interested in selling their blog, then let me know. And so I was like, okay. I mean, how often does that happen? That people want to sell their blogs, and so he kept saying it. And then finally, when I realized that I wanted to make this pivot. Then I was like, hmm, I wonder if he would be interested in my blog. So I reached out and he said yes, and we made the deal and it happened and it was it was very easy. So it worked out. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I have a whole bunch of self selfish questions I want to ask, but let me ask the questions for the audience first. So let's can we do some some like nitty-gritty Facebook ad stuff and let's then we'll we'll jump into some other things. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so you had kind of like what you were talking about where you were at in 2015, taking an Amy Porterfield class, you hadn't really made much sales. You're like, let me try Facebook. I'm guessing you were spending less than $500 a month on the ads. Am I? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, my first campaign, I spent, I think somewhere between two and 300. My second campaign was right around the same. Yeah. Okay, that's what I guess. I actually wrote down $300. That was my guess. Um, okay, so I would say, that's like the niche that listens. So um, many of the, the DMs I get are, I've taken an Amy Porterfield class uh, or Jasmine Starr or Marie Forleo. I feel like they're like the, the triad of dopeness that so many awesome course creators come out of. And um, they're like, I have about two or $300 a month I want to spend. I've ran a beta program and I've maybe gotten like two sales or like I'm doing it for free and I'm ready to launch. Um, and I got to be honest, I've been telling people I think you should wait to run ads and you should convert more organically. I don't think you're going to get very much results at $300 a month, especially on an offer that's not yet proven out. Uh, then I hear you tell the story and I'm kidding in mind though, this is 2015. So we're five years later into the game, but I'm wondering what, 
like if you want to be like you're wrong tom do it three dollars in ads go for it like I'd, I'd love to hear how what your response would be in a scenario or if a monica came to you a 2015 monica came to you in 2020 and said here's where i'm at i want to give it a shot a- any thoughts you want to share Sure. So Facebook ads. So if you have a program that you want to sell and you have a funnel that you put together, so that sounds like the the scenario you're talking about, then Facebook ads can be used in one of two ways. You can either use Facebook ads to test out, to drive traffic, to test out if your funnel works and where the tweaks need to be made throughout the funnel. Or you can wait, as you suggested, until you know you've got a fine-tuned funnel, things are working, and then let's just rock and roll and scale this baby up. So there are two ways that you can come about it. If you have the money to invest and you know that you have a marketing budget that you want to use to invest in your business, then just go in with that expectation. I'm testing it out. I'm testing to see how my funnel works. I want to get people through the funnel because maybe you're like me where I didn't have a lot of organic traffic to really test things out. Um, um, so I wanted to pay a little bit of money for that for that traffic so I can get people into my world and share my message with them. So just have that expectation. And something that I tell my students and my clients all the time is that, you know, if you're driving traffic into your funnel, then there's going to be a certain percentage of people that are going to buy. But then the other people that come in through your funnel who don't end up buying right now in your seven day, 14 day funnel, whatever that looks like, you know, they're on your list, they're in your world so that when they are ready, as long as you, you know, stay in front of them, you know, and be maintain top of mind, then once they're ready to take action and move forward with you to the next level, which could be your paid program, then, you know, you've made that sale down the road. So I want you to think, you know, short term as far as what your results are today, but also long term. And what is this doing for the longevity of my business? And so something that I think every business should be doing is spending a little bit of money, maybe not when you're first, first starting out, but if you have the the budget and to invest in your business starting out, then certainly you can do this. But once you get things rocking and rolling, I think every business should have an evergreen traffic strategy. A lot of times that looks like SEO. People get really good on SEO, but then you can also get very intentional with it um, and use Facebook ads to get in front of the right people to bring into your world. So those two approaches can help you really grow and scale for the long term. Boom, Monica in the building, y'all. We are not going to have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just want to make it explicit because then maybe this is my own my own thing because I'm sick of I'm sick of like the the gurus being like here's a calculator and people plug into the calculator and they're like wow I'm gonna make ten thousand dollars off like four hundred the calculator says so and I'm like they're in this position that we're talking about where it's like only a couple sales um, so what I'm hearing and so tell me if I'm wrong is when we say test. Test can mean that you will get awesome data, but that data could be that this isn't working, which means you might not make any of that $300 back. Is that, am I correct? In you that? might, you might find that out. You might find out that you are sending people in to watch your webinar, um, but your webinar isn't converting. And so, but you have to have people watching your webinar to know, first of all, are they going to watch all the way through? Second of all, are they going to get to the pitch? Third of all, are they going to take action from your pitch? So, I mean, you have to have traffic in order to test that. If you're getting great organic traffic and you already have people watching your webinar organically to find that out, then by all means, you know, take that data and use it to figure out where you need to make the tweaks. Maybe people are watching the webinar, they're engaged through the webinar, but then in your follow-up series before your offer closes, they're not taking action. They're not opening your emails. They're not clicking through. So that's where you can find out that, okay, we've got some some holes we need to fill there in order to really increase conversion so that we can get it to the point of profitability. But you don't know that if you don't have people going through your funnel. So that's where Facebook ads can be a tool to help you figure that out. But as you said, I think I think this is an important conversation that a lot of people aren't saying because you need to go into it with the expectation. I mean, we all want to hit go on our webinar funnel and have it just work like a dream and the you know the money coming in, but that's not always the way that it works. And so you've got to be solution focused and figuring out where those holes are. And the ads can only do so much. So the ads for this type of funnel, they're bringing in the leads. What we do with our clients is we'll do retargeting ads to hit people back um, as they're going through the funnel and bring them back to the sales page and remind them of the offer that's closing down. But the funnel has to convert. The sales page has to convert. It's got to be an offer that people are wanting. But you don't find that out if you don't get your offer in front of people. 
Mm, I love it. I love it. Uh, so just, and, and, and I totally could just be on my soapbox, but like, I'm so, my heart is just always breaking for people who just waste the money because of the gurus. Um, so what, what I'm hearing, tell me if I'm correct or if you're like, Tom, get off your soapbox is like, it's awesome to test because it's true. If you're going to run $3 an ad, you're going to get more people in that week than you would get in a couple months on organic. Uh, but you have to be prepared to lose the money if you want to high speed it. If you can't lose the money, if you're like, if I lose this $300, I'm screwed. Right. Then just stay on organic until you can test with Absolutely. Would you say that's Absolutely. Fair? Yeah. You want to go into it with the proper mindset that, hey, whatever happens, I'm learning something here. I'm learning that it's working or I'm learning that there are some tweaks to be made. And as we're growing our businesses, I mean, that we're going to hit, you know, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. But the most successful businesses are the ones that keep going and figuring out, you know, okay, if this isn't working, then I need to figure out what isn't working about it and how to make it work. And so that's where people, you know, a lot of people try to promote like Facebook ads. It's a missing, missing link to success, right? You figure out Facebook ads, you're going to make all this money, but really there's more to it. Facebook is a piece of the strategy. It's not the entire strategy. It's, it's not like a Harry Potter wand. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it, let me tell you, it's so fun though when it works. So once you get to that point, if you just understand that there may need some tweaking involved, there may need some upfront investment, you know, you may not have an instant ROI and, and that can be okay if you have this big picture, long-term vision for growing your business. But again, I mean, it's a traffic driver. You've got to get the traffic to your front door in order to find out if people are going to take you up on your offer. Mm, damn. Yes. Okay, let's talk about that that evergreen uh, traffic that you were talking about before. Um, so, you know, like I said, most of our folks are course creators and coaches or people with some sort of message. So w- what does that look like? If you, if you have some, some money to keep some sort of evergreen traffic builder, what would that look like? Sure. So that can look at, at a couple of different ways. Um, my favorite way is for it to be driving traffic to a lead magnet. And that can be a lead magnet with a funnel on the back end. Or, you know, if you're just starting off, it can just be driving traffic to a lead magnet to get people on your email list, you know, so that you can get your newsletter in front of them and maintain that top of mind relationship, right? So that is the simplest way. Another way is also very simple, actually, is driving traffic to a free piece of content. So um, if you have, you know, blog posts that kind of are the starting point or very popular with with search, you see that you're getting a lot of organic traffic, maybe they're monetized. Um, a lot of my blogging clients have, you know, monetized with affiliate marketing in their blog posts and just driving traffic to those blog posts you can do for a very low cost. And so it doesn't have to be a lot of money. Um, just do whatever you're comfortable with, but you can be driving traffic to watch a video, to, dr- to a blog post, um, to your lead magnet. And then you're building up those warm audiences for when you do a launch or, you know, you have your funnel in place, you have a promotion, um, something that you want to offer, then you have these people in your warm audiences that you can get back in front of. And time and time again, we find in working with our clients that the warm audiences, the ones that are already in the world, you know, in their world, um, are the ones that are going to convert at a higher rate than the cold audiences. So that's why I like to always have an evergreen strategy going with Facebook ads. It can be, you know, again, going all the way through a funnel, or it can just be simple driving traffic, building up those video views or growing your email list. So, okay. So lead gen. Awesome. Let's talk about conversion. So how, how long have you been finding folks need to be warmed up before they go from like, stranger to opted in to purchase like any <laughs> any advice or anything around reflections you have around there yeah so it really depends on the audience or the offer and the offer um so it can depend on your back end offer and maybe the price point of your offer you know maybe you have a thousand dollar coaching package or several thousand dollar coaching package you know then it might take people a longer amount of time to really warm up to you but maybe not there are no hard and fast rules around this but with your front end offer this is where where it can really make a difference too. So a lot of times we'll find that if we promote like a simple checklist, something that's just a really 
easy yes to get people onto the email list, we can get a lot of leads for a very low cost compared to like a webinar where it's a bigger ask, right? So the webinar is about an hour long. So that's a time commitment. Um, usually the cost per lead for a webinar is going to be higher than this. Um, but if people watch your webinar, they watch all the way through during the webinar, you're building that relationship with the audience, you're building that rapport, and then you have the opportunity right there on the webinar to introduce your paid offer and what the next step is for them if they want to continue this path with you. So that can be where you know the, the point to sale can be much faster, but it can, you know, the cost per lead might be higher than it is a checklist. So it kind of depends on the front end offer and the back end offer. Um, but really, you've got to figure out as you're building your funnel, where do people need to be mindset wise, money wise, you know, to in order to say yes to your paid offer. So what do they have to already know? What do they have to believe? You know, many times it's that they have to believe in themselves that they can actually do that. So like with Facebook ads, one of my goals is to help people believe that it's possible that they can implement a Facebook ad strategy in their business, that they can learn it. It doesn't have to be this big, scary thing because then that gets people ready to commit to taking the next step to figuring out how to create that, that campaign, that strategy for themselves. So with your offer, your paid offer, figure out what do, where do people need to be, you know, mindset wise, commitment wise to, in order to take that step and make that commitment to going the next step. Mm, you just like articulated something that I've like have been practicing, but didn't know why. So I always tell like my clients when I'm coaching them on their sales calls to like start off by saying like, Hey, I would just want to check in with you. They're talking to their, to their lead. Like how, how are you feeling? Or how comfortable are you feeling that like, like I do everything right. So I give you all the tools. How confident are you that you actually can get results? Right. And so you name yes. it. It's because like your person has to be in a mindset that they actually can carry through on what it is they're purchasing from you. Absolutely. Saying, right? Yes. Um, yeah. That's a great um, question to ask. So, I mean, that can be something that you put in your, in your webinar or in your email funnel. So, um, you know, is, is helping people decide, you know, do I believe in myself? Sometimes if you, you know, if you, ask the question point blank, you know, many times, you know, our ego doesn't want to say, no, 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 you know, I, I can't do that. You know, you want to say, well, yes, you know, if I have the tools, if I have the resources in front of me, then I'm determined that I can make it happen. Yes. Monica in the building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are you finding works well for, for book a call and for, for contacts, you know, this is for like our coaches who have like, you know, two, three K a month, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or like a 12 week 3k group coaching program or something to that effect where they know that they're not like such a big name, like an Amy Porterfield where they can just sound a webinar that they actually have to get people on a phone. What are you seeing uh, a funnel that works well to get people on the phone? So I guess I don't have like a specific funnel in mind, but I would, I would, keep in mind about, you know, where do they need to be in order to make that phone call, to take that step. So building rapport, having testimonials, I think that's going to be huge. Um, I know my, for myself, when I was met with a Facebook ad, and then I ended up getting on a phone call to talk about the program that was a significant investment for my business, um, that it was really all of the testimonials and rapport building that was done up front that really got me in. So I think that you can do that with a webinar, um, but also on the webinar that you need to think about all the other touch points and then the follow-ups and then also, you know, following up like you did with me, you sent so many follow-up emails about like, Hey, just a quick reminder for our, for our, you know, call. Um, and so make sure that you're following up and then getting them to commit to being there ahead of time so that you don't have the no-shows because I know that's something that can happen a lot too. Um, but really just, you know, building the rapport up front so that they know that this is going to be a value to them to get on the phone call. And it's not going to be, you know, a sales pitch. It's really, I'm, I'm really interested in taking the next step and I just want to make sure that we are a good fit to work together. I love that. That's awesome. It, it, another aha for me, the only high ticket promo I've ever signed up for was, was Cat Howells, the Academy. And she retargeted me from May, June, July, August, and I finally signed up in September. 
five months of retargeting. <laughs> I love it. See, so you took, you took a while in order to commit, right? So you needed that follow-up. You needed those touch points in order to make the decision to move forward. And so keep that in mind, especially with high ticket programs that, you know, many times it can take all those multiple touch points for them to get ready or for a high ticket program, you know, maybe they just need to be saving up the money to make that investment. So, you know, keep in mind that it might not be the right time for that level of program. For a smaller offer, it's easier to say a quick yes. That's what's up. So for the folks who wanted the Facebook ad nitty gritty, you're welcome. For the folks who are like, no, I know y'all aren't falling asleep. This is all good stuff. But if you're like, Tom, this is going over my head. First of all, DM me or in a second here, we're going to let you know where you can uh, contact Monica and be like, this, 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 I was with you, but you lost me. We'll get you that too. We're going to not like broaden it out. So let's talk about leadership and running a team. So sure. for folks who don't know, when we say an agency, it, it basically is, you know, it's not just Monica anymore running the ad. She's got a whole team doing things. You got assistants and this and that. So can you take us a little bit through how you went from just doing it yourself to having a team? If you don't mind sharing some of the, the sure. build out or any of that kind of story. Yeah. So when I started off as a Facebook ads coach, um, I mean, I didn't really have this long-term tra trajectory of someday I'm going to have an agency. I just knew I was enjoying what I was doing, working with businesses, uh, business owners who were building, you know, committed to building and scaling their businesses. And then I launched my course and then I needed to put some systems and processes into place. And then people wanted me to run their ads for them. And that's when I was like, okay, I need to figure out how I can do this in an authentic way. So what I did is I actually had somebody who I just hired on my team um, she came on as a VA to help me with social media and just, you know, admin related things, but she actually, um, has her, has her own blog and business and she's no longer working with me now because that's grown so much, but she was working on my, on my team as a VA and she had actually hired me as a coach several months before. So I knew that when we're working together that she had picked it up really fast. She really caught on to Facebook ads, um, and you know, the tech and the strategy behind it. But, and so when I started to have these clients that wanted me to manage ads for them, I worked with her and very closely, we got on Zoom just like this, got on Zoom, shared screens, and we walked through, you know, brainstorming the campaigns, setting them up, how I make decisions as to how to test and optimize and tweak, adjusting budgets, all of that. I really just walked her through all of my, um, all of my strategy and behind the scenes. And then she started creating processes. So actually documenting and putting into words how, you know, what, when this happens, then do this so that we could then, as we were growing the team, train other people to do it. So then she ended up leading the training as we brought more people onto the team. And then as new situations came up, new challenges, then we would just add that to our documentation. And so now we have very thorough documentation, but we're still constantly encountering new things like, okay, that was something that maybe I assumed somebody would think to do, but it wasn't explicitly stated. So we got to make sure that that's in our our processes and our documentation. So now I put it on my team. We'll talk through, you know, if there's a hole in our documentation and our process, we talk through how to best manage that right now. And then my team is empowered to go update the documentation and make it clear for others. We have ads team meetings now. Every two weeks, we talk about, you know, what's going on with our clients, or if there's any new challenge that we encountered in the ads manager, or we're seeing this message now, or this has changed, you know, just keeping everybody in the loop. So communication is very important, but then also documentation is very important as well. Those systems, those systems, Absolutely. folks. <laughs> <laughs> what does that what does that look like for y'all when you when you put together a meeting or you're going to talk through holes in these things? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're able to identify those things, how you move people through them? Because um, I, I like I hear you say it so casually, but it's it's a huge skill. So any, any wisdom you can share with people about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, anytime, you know, something happens that I was unexpected, you know, I thought this was going to happen and then this happened or this didn't happen. Then that's where, you know, I have my, a conversation with my team and I try and be, you know, solution focused. I, I've definitely grown in my leadership, whereas before I might be like, oh, you know, why did that happen? What happened? You know, why did we drop the ball on that or whatever? And now I'm just like, okay, so something was missing. You know, there was either, you know, 
something didn't connect the dots. And so we just need to figure out how we can prevent this in the future. And so that's the way that I like to approach it. Um, and so I've read a lot of leadership books. <laughs> um, if Radical Candor is a great one. Dare to Lead by Brene Brown is another great one. Um, but really just having that communication and then being open to hearing, you know, feedback and ideas. And now I'm in the place where I'm putting the decision and solution on my team. And I say, okay, you guys, you know, talk amongst yourselves, figure out what you think is going to work best. And then just clue me in. I'll let you know if I agree or if I, you know, have another idea and then we'll move forward. So really at this point, it's like just trying to look at it as to how we can approach things differently in the future to try and, you know, get around some of those surprises that may happen. Well, you mentioned Brene Brown. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, you know, she says like, to blame is the shift discomfort. So, so many bosses, we do what you described where it was like, oh no, why'd this happen? How could you let that? Because it's like such a terrible feeling when you let down a client. So you kind of briefly talked about it, reading books and stuff like that. But could you talk about any ahas or like shifts or how did you transition from like the reaction to the, the solution? Yeah, I think that... Um that just keeping in mind that everybody wants to do a good job, you know, everybody wants to do a good job. And if you're hiring the right people, you know, and you, you can tell, like I've learned in my hiring that, you know, there are red flags that somebody is going to be maybe a good interviewer, but not such a great implementer, you know, and actually do what they say. Um, so there, my hiring process has gotten a lot better, a lot better over the, over the years. Um, but, but just knowing that, you know, I trust these people, I wouldn't have brought them onto my team and trusted them with my clients, with my business, with my reputation, if I didn't know that they sincerely wanted to do a good job. So just keeping that in mind that everybody wants to do a good job. And also my team is very receptive to feedback. So while I have, you know, calm down how I approach things, you know, when something does go wrong, I know that my team members, they're going to say, okay, well, I'm so sorry that that happened or that that ended up that way. Um, and you know, I missed this and they take responsibility, but I'm also taking responsibility for, you know, the communication that I didn't say, you know, something that I assumed. And that's where, you know, I'm learning that a lot of these, a lot of issues come up because I quite frankly just assumed something and didn't talk through why it was important or why I was asking for that information, you know? And so as I give the big picture and as, you know, the longer we work together, they can kind of foresee those things as well. Um, but just really the assumption that everybody wants to do a good job. Nobody wants to let you down. Nobody wants to let the client down that, you know, we're all in this together to, to do our best work. How do you decide? Cause I think with with uh, folks who start off as freelancers and then move into owning the business, it's like there can become this scarcity mindset of like, oh, when I, the client pays me this and I'm the freelancer, I get all of it. But now like each person I hire, they're getting a slice. How do you like decide when it's like, yes, it's time to hire somebody to then do this? Like how do you kind of weigh that in your mind of the like cost benefit ratio? Yeah. I think that starting my business, I was always reinvesting into my business. And so with growing my team, um, I mean, that's the way that I look at it is that for my team, any time that we are starting to feel like, okay, we've, you know, where are we going to put this client? Who's going to handle this client? Um, and we're feeling stretched and people are letting me know that, okay, I'm kind of getting at capacity right now. Then that's where we know like, okay, I mean, we still want to grow this business and we want to be open to taking on new clients. I never want to be in a position where I tell a client, sorry, no, we don't have the capacity to work with you right now. Can you come back in three months? Because they're going to go find somebody else, right? So, so that's when we're like, okay, we are, you know, if we're starting to feel that we're, you know, getting a little bit stretched, then that's when we start to look for new people to join our team. Um, but really, I just have the mindset that, you know, as I grow my team, as we can handle more clients, as we can take on more clients and serve them well, that really it's for the long-term benefit of the business and the health of the business to know. I mean, with our clients, they pay us monthly. So we love that recurring revenue. And, you know, if we can bring on somebody new to the team and that can free somebody else up or allow us to bring on another client or more clients, then it's, it's going to benefit the team in the long run. 
how how like close to the details are you versus like the like eagle in the sky seeing the big picture you know what i mean like as as the leader can you talk a little bit about your approach to like in the day to day versus like the thing and like i'm a practitioner of this but also i'm the like you know what i'm saying is that yes okay Okay. Yeah. That, that, this has been an evolution. Um, so upfront, you know, very beginning when I had my first team member that I was training her on my processes and how I adjust budgets and all of that. I mean, I was in the ads manager every single day. And even when she was taking the lead on managing the clients, then I was still checking in, you know, and seeing, you know, is the team adjusting budgets the way that I would, you know, are they setting up things exactly how I would, are they making the same decisions that I would, I was very much into it. And now I've learned to trust my team and uh, so I check in, um, you know, on how things are going. I'm still the one meeting with my clients um, to have that those touch points because many times, I mean, they're coming to work with me and my team because of our relationship. So I'm still the, the client-facing person in our meetings, but my team will communicate with them via email in between our meetings. And I'm starting to have my team members join me in those meetings as well so that my my clients can see, you know, they know that I have a team behind me, but it, it helps to build that trust too when they see my amazing team member also joining us and they know that they're in good hands. So, um, so now I have my ad techs, I have a copywriter and a graphic designer. I have an ads manager who kind of takes the lead on reviewing things. So she'll review copy, the graphics, um, the ad setup and all of that, and then really work with the ad tech in talking through strategy and making adjustments. And all along the way, they're keeping me up to date. And of course, if they have a question that they feel like, you know, this is something we haven't encountered before and we really like to get your take on it, then they come to me. So really I'm in the work, um, I'm going through the work of clockworking my business, which is another book. I love books, uh, by Mike McCallowitz. Um, I highly recommend it, but it's really so that I can learn to step into the CEO role of designing, he calls it design time, but strategizing and building my business as opposed to being in the day to day. So I'm learning to trust my team more. And that's why we're so thorough with our processes and documenting those processes um, that, you know, I, I want them to be able to go through the documentation and come up with the question themselves or, you know, come up with what they think is the best solution and then just let me know what they think is the best solution. And then I can, you know, let them take action on it. I, th I think it's one of the biggest challenges that managers slash leaders face is what we just talked about. Because Absolutely. It's, so, it's so, it's so hard not, especially if you're good at what you're managing people to do. Like it's yes. so hard not just to go, let me just do it. You know what I mean? It's so hard. <laughs> Not to have your hand in all the, the pieces of the, the pie, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and like I said, it's my reputation, right? So, so my website is monicalouhi.com. My, I mean, I'm the face of my brand. And so I was really nervous when I started growing my team and letting them, you know, kind of manage things and, you know, keeping my eye, you know, uh, just starting to take my eye off of things. I was very nervous. Um, but, you know, things went well overall. Like, I mean, nothing dramatic happened where it ended up that we lost a client because of something horrible, you know? And so as you kind of, you know, start slowly with building that trust with your team, then eventually you'll learn. And I mean, I've had people that will move, they've moved positions because I found that, you know, my ads manager, she started off as an ad tech and then she really started to show me that she had these higher thinking, you know, higher level strategic skills. Um, and she really had a lot of great experience even before she came to my team with Facebook ads. And so it was, it was just a good fit. And it was something that she enjoyed. She it liked that role rather than being in the weeds herself. So really I have consistent communication with my team. I meet with each team member once a month and just a quick check-in just to talk about how it is, you know, with their workload, first of all, you know, do they have capacity to take on more as we bring on new clients or are they get, kind of getting to the max? Because all of my team members are part-time. They have some more than others, but they all have other responsibilities. Some are, have families with young children, some have their own blog, other things that they have going on in their life. Um, and so, 
uh, I want to talk with them about like, is this still a good fit for you? Because I want to know ahead of time if somebody is thinking like, mm, this isn't really working for my family situation, my whatever situation. Um, so I want to get ahead of that. And so that's why I have consistent communication um, with each team member and check in. And then I also open the door for feedback and suggestions, process improvements, you know, what other ideas that you have for us. And um, so just having that connection time with my team really helps me to understand where we are and, you know, and know who's going to be a good fit. If they're feeling like, well, I'd really like to spend my time in this area. You know, I, I like this better than I like this. Then we, you know, we're so, we're so, you know, small and nimble. We can, we can figure out the best way so that everybody's in their zone of genius. I love it. Yes. (laughs) Well, Monica, for the good folks out there who are as excited to get this chance to talk with you as I am, and they want to continue the conversation, where do they go and do that? Sure. So um, my website is monicalouie.com. I also have a podcast called Flourish to Seven Figures. Um, So that's a great way to check in with me every week. Um, But I do have a free guide that I'd love to offer to your listeners and your audience. Um, If that's cool with you, Tom. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So it's my free Facebook ads starter kit. And so if you're interested in getting started with Facebook ads, it walks you through the six simple steps to creating campaigns that convert. Plus there's a glossary. If some of the terms we've talked about are just kind of like, I don't know what happened there. Um, I've got a glossary of key terms in there plus a checklist. I am one for checklists. I love checklists. So I've got a checklist and at the, at the back of the guide so that you can plan out your next high converting campaign. And you can find that at monicalouie.com slash Tom. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, if you're on the go, you weren't able to write that down. Tomroll.com slash Monica are the show notes for today. Tomroll.com slash M O N I C A. Tomroll.com slash Monica is where you will find Monica's podcast. You will find her. What else did you say? Was the it, free Facebook ad starter kit. Yes, your free Facebook ad starter kit, monicalouie.com slash Tom. Y'all, come on. She created a website that is honoring y'all. So please, if you want to, if I can call in my chips, uh, just go and sign up for it, even if you don't have no idea about Facebook ads, so we can show the celebration community that we, we do share our gratitude with the folks who show up here. So honestly, right now, hit pause. If you're like, what was it again? Look in the show notes down below. You'll see it right there. Tomlin.com slash Monica. Boom. Click on it right there. You're in. Sign up. Hey. Does that sound like a plan to you too? That sounds awesome. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so Monica, if, if we could, I would talk for another hour because this was super awesome. So, um, you know, next time you're having a launch or anything like that, We'd love to have you back on to help you promote it, to help you, you know, just to have an excuse to bring you back for part two. Does that sound good? Wonderful. I'd love it. Thank you. Definitely. So uh, we want to end the way we began from a place of gratitude. You're awesome. We wish you all the best. We're sending you all of our celebration energy with you for much success and joy along your journey. So thank you, Monica, for, for being with us today. Well, thank you so much. I I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to share with your audience. Thank you so much, Tom. My pleasure. So the way we end is our closing ritual is for you to share an invitation with the audience. So what would you like to invite them to do, to be, to consider, to evolve into, to think about, to read, to examine? What is your invitation? My invitation is just to think through where you really want your life and your business to go. And then, and without any, without any limitations, I really want you to open yourself up and think about what could be possible if anything could happen, which I believe anything can happen. If anything could happen, if you can make anything come true for you, for your business, for your audience, for the people you serve, what would that be? And just don't be afraid to dream big. So I just want to invite you to go for it, go after your dreams and make them happen. Mm, One of the best invitations there was. I love that. Thank you once again, Monica. Well, thank you. I want to thank you for listening to this week's Deeper Listening, Re-Listening series. I don't know how many more times I can squeeze in the word listening into this sentence. I want to thank you, as I shared in the beginning, for sharing your time and energy listening to this entire episode. As I said in the beginning, I'd love to know, do you know what year 
this episode was recorded in. And I'd love to know what stuck out to you. What moved you? What questions do you have? And if you have any suggestions for what you'd like future topics to cover or future guests we should feature. My friends, I look forward to you joining us again next week for a new episode in our Relisten series. And as always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh, one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Yay. <laughs>